Okay, guys. Uh, here is the next next speaker, Azan from Longhorn Games, where the optimum way for hyper casual games prototyping. Thank you, Azan, for coming. The stage is yours. All right. Thank you, Alexander, and thanks everyone for joining my speech today. And thanks to Hyper Games Conference as well for inviting me. Yeah. So today we'll be talking about the optimal way for hyper casual prototyping. We'll be talking about some do's and don'ts. And I will be talking about the knowledge and experience we have gained over the course of last two years developing uh, hyper casual games. Okay, so a little bit of information about Long Run Games. So we are founded in uh, October 2020 and, uh, with uh, two co founders, and we mostly build hyper casual and arcade adult games. And we are Istanbul based, so we are in Turkey at the moment. Um, I think we have developed around 200 hyper-casual prototypes by now, and we keep building new ones. Um, so yeah, we have two launches and one soft launch, and we have more than 25 million downloads worldwide. So our latest hit is Crowd Evolution, uh, which is also hyper-casual, and I will also give some examples uh, about the game in this presentation. Yeah, so what we'll be talking about today, uh, we'll, be start, uh, we'll be talking about first, what are the hyper-casual games? And what does a typical hyper-casual project life cycle, life cycle look like from the ideation to uh, testing? And we'll be seeing some, some, some tips and tricks. Okay, so what are hyper-casual games? I'm pretty sure uh, uh, most of you guys know that, but let's go over it quickly. So they provide some instant gameplay. So as soon as you uh, open up the game, you can just uh, start playing right away. So you can play it with only one thumb. So it's pretty simple mechanic. It can be a drag and drop. It can be a push, uh, uh, hold and release, etc. They are easy to produce because uh, they are not really complex games. They require minimal input, but they provide maximum output. So with just with your uh, thumb, you can play for, let's say, 10 minutes. Um, they are immersive. So as soon as you start playing the game, uh, it takes your total attention and you just focus on the game. At least it should be that way. They are repetitive because since they are uh, simplistic games, they uh, cover it up by repetition. And they are pleasing and catchy, so that means they are pleasing to look at, and they are most of them they're interesting. So yeah, that's a typical hyper casual game. And what does a, a hyper casual project lifecycle look like? So we start with the ideation phase, because we need to have an idea to build upon first, right? And once we have the idea, we plan the project, and after that, the development starts, the art and assets uh, are defined and they are being created. And we start to program the game. And then if everything goes well, we start testing the game. And as you can see, the project management is on the right side because throughout, throughout the development of the project, the project management is uh, always involved. And we'll be talking about that later on. Okay, so how to generate some ideas for hyper-casual games? The first one, the typical one, is just brainstorming together with your team, going into a room and start discussing some ideas. Uh, that sometimes work. And keeping up social media is a must. And just changing something with, or with something that is already successful uh, tends to work uh, quite well. Combining two successful mechanics elements or some something from uh, two successful games uh, uh, has been proven, proven uh, to be working super well. And trying a game that is uh, relatively old, uh, some old game uh, can work sometimes. And checking the top game charts and taking inspiration from that, inspiration from that uh, is also a good way. And you can also use some tools, for example, Storeglide, which 
lists you uh, the newest games. So yeah, using one of these techniques, you can start creating a list of hyper casual project ideas and you should regularly expand this pool. You need to add new and new ideas because what are you going to do if your current game fails the tests and you need to start working on the next in the line? You need to have something available already, right? So you should always have a pool of ideas that are waiting to be picked up. And these ideas should be universally playable, enjoyable, acceptable, because you want to, uh, you want to um, reach to the widest audience as possible. And you don't need to reinvent the whole genre. You can just take inspiration from the existing games and change something slightly and work on top of this. Yeah, so picking an idea, I think it has some criteria. So you first need to check the similar games and see how they were successful and try to take something successful from them, some ele element of success or something that's pleasing to uh, see or play or whatever it is. You need to check the similar games and you need to gather some data, as much data as possible, and you need to lean on that data. So you shouldn't be moving by your instincts, but you should be uh, moving according to the data. And you should always be mindful about the CPI because CPI is most of the time is the hardest thing to improve on hyper casual games. Well, if you have a high CPI, it's, su it's super hard to take it lower. So from the get go, you need to be careful about CPI. And if you have an idea of a potential unique CPI moment, this is a, that's a great thing. Uh, that means you have one step ahead already. So, yeah. As an example of this is the crowd evolution. Crowd evolution was a result of uh, model and improve methodology, which means you model a game, you, then you start thinking, how can I improve this? How, what can I add to this? So we have combined two, uh, we have combined different mechanics from different games. For example, gate mechanics with evolution mechanics. And after a few rotations, it or, it's already mega hit now. So that's just a solid example how this methodology actually works. Okay, now let's say we have an idea and we need to start planning. We need to start planning on how are we going to implement this idea into an actual game. So one thing we have made obligatory for our projects recently is having a GDD for all the uh, projects. Because a GDD provides a summary for everyone. So everyone from the team can open up the GDD and check the summary, check the mechanics, the core loops, the reference games, so that they, they don't have to Google it, even if, if they do it anyways. Most of the time people don't check it, but a GDD uh, helps with that. And it provides the progression steps, uh, the, eco the changes in economy, onboarding in metal loops, so whatever question you might have about the game, GDD should answer so that everyone in the team uh, can uh, align in a fast way. So that's the benefit of GDD. It also helps the game developer, sorry, the game designer, because during uh, the preparation of the GDD, they also uh, find some questions that they never ask and they have to answer those questions. So it's a method that's been working super well for us and we recommend it to everyone. Yeah, so let's say you have the GDD and you need to uh, prioritize, some, prioritize some tasks now because the order of the tasks matter. You can't just say to the, to the developer that, okay, this is a game and you need to develop this and you're on your own. That wouldn't work most of the time. You need to tell the developer that these tasks should be done in that order and in that amount of time. So what has been working uh, better for us has been splitting the project into multiple phases. So let's say the first phase is uh, just the super simple playable prototype. And the second phase is adding a little bit more polishing and the last phase is let's say, uh, making it testable uh, on the uh, ad networks. So this helps us 
uh, splitting the projects into multiple chunks and and dealing with those separately. You should always start with the basic tasks for the same reason, and you should avoid early stage polishing. This is something sometimes you fall into. It's a trap, but we should avoid this as much as possible in the hyper casual uh, universe. And we should always aim for a testable iteration as fast as possible. Because of the nature of the hyper casual games, most of the games are going to die. And we have to see that as soon as possible. So prioritizing, prioritizing tasks also help with that as well. And yeah, deadlines. Deadlines uh, have been something we've been kind of not super happy about because we were missing some deadlines and we decided to implement something new. So this aligns with the uh, splitting the project into multiple phases. So we set deadlines for these phases separately. Let's, so, it, so when we do that, we have three or four deadlines. So that means we are not missing one huge deadline. If we miss a deadline, we can always cover it up by working a little bit faster. So this also helps us aiming the earliest possible uh, prototype uh, in a clearer way. And we constantly check if the deadlines are going to be met. And if not, we take some action. We try to meet all of our deadlines. And if we miss some deadlines, we do some retro meetings and we discuss what uh, has gone wrong. Also, likewise, if we uh, meet a deadline, we do a retro and we discuss what we have done correctly. Yeah, so this was the planning phase. Let's say we have now our plan for the project. Uh, we have our project phases. We have our tasks. Everyone is uh, ready to uh, start working on the game. One thing that is, uh, that is being overlooked often is using some assets from the asset stores. Using an asset, purchasing an asset from the asset store and using it in your project is totally doable and viable. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but this is something being overlooked and we just don't do it for some reason. I think we should not forget about it. This is important. But sometimes our games require some custom assets, of course, like custom animations, models, etc. If we develop these kind of models, we should keep them in an organized place. If we use them on, in only one project and we forget about them, then they will get lost and the work is uh, also get lost. But if we use a tool to keep them together and organize, we can use the same assets in the next projects as well. That way we can keep the value that we, were, that we created in one project and we can uh, take advantage of it in the next project as well. We've been doing that. We now have a good library and it's been working pretty good for us. And yeah, reusing assets whenever possible. This is a little bit different than what I previously said. What, what, I, what I mean here is that, let's say you have used some water shader in a CPI video and it worked well. So you shouldn't be trying another water shader in the next CPI video. You can just use the same one that you know that worked well and it was battle tested. So at least for a while, it will be working good still because people ideas change uh, time to time, but not so often. So if you, if you know that some assets are working, just re reuse them. You don't have to create a new one on every project. This is also something we can overlook sometimes. And another issue is we start to work on a project and we create some assets, but then due to the nature of the game design, because of the dynamic nature of it, some plans change. And then some of the assets, they just go waste. Uh, this is not good for anyone. Nobody wants to see their work uh, going into trash can. And we need to do whatever we can to prevent this from happening. Sometimes it's inevitable but if we have this mindfulness about this issue, 
I think we can minimize at least uh, this negative effect. Well, yeah, let's get into the programming part. Although we are building not so complex games, hyper casual games, we do believe that having a coding standard is super important. A coding, star coding standard for every developer should be applied in all of the projects. That helps with the quality of the projects and going from one project to the other becomes easier. Developers can switch projects in an easier way. And we, we don't have this uh, issue with uh, not liking the previous developer so much uh, with that kind of coding standard. And it also helps developers improve themselves because they write better code, they feel better. We, we just care about our code quality basically. And we recommend that as well. Another thing we believe that is super important is just before writing even a single line of code, you should first draw a flowchart and you should define what kind of components will be taking place in the game and what are the relationships uh, will be between those components. And this helps everyone, all the developers understand the game better and the structure better. And this helps if a new developer joins uh, to the project, they can just open up the flowchart and see what is going on. And if we want to change something in the future, we can also just open up the flowchart, add some new relationships, and then just edit the code accordingly. So there are a lot of benefits in using some flowchart. The thing here, the key point is that you always keeping the flowchart and the code in sync. If you do that, then it's a super useful tool. And yeah, packages. Packages are super duper important for hyper casual games. That's because hyper casual games tend to share some common functionality, common mechanics a lot, unlike let's say the PC games. And due to the nature of the hyper casual games, we can, let's say, create a mechanic package, let's say a front uh, stack package, let's say a vertical stack package, um, an arcade idle movement package. So there are a lot of packages that we can create and use throughout our projects. And if we don't do that, I believe we are losing a lot of time on, uh, just because of that. Every CDU must have their list of packages uh, at their disposal and they should be able to pick up a package, quickly implement that and just save a few days uh, of development. So we, I think we currently have around maybe 50 packages at Long Run Games and it's working super well for us and we constantly add new packages all the time and we highly recommend that. Another thing I believe is being overlooked is builds. So in the game development world, um, automating things is not super common from my experience. And some studios, uh, they take manual builds for App Store and Android, and they push those builds to the stores manually again. That means one person have to deal with the builds the whole day. And if, if let's say we are a city of 30 people, that, that, is, that is not acceptable because then not, not even a single person can handle that, that uh, kind of load. If we automate our builds on every push uh, to our uh, version control system, a new build should be started. And then the uh, the output of this build should be uploaded to an, uh, an app store or the uh, play store. And then this whole thing should be automated. There should be no manual intervention. So on every change, we should get a new build. This saves us time. Uh, this minimizes the errors. Uh, we can easily see 
where the build was failed because we constantly take builds. Um, so this is just a DevOps mentality uh, that we should apply into uh, our hyper casual uh, prototyping. Yeah, and project management. Uh, now we are here, we, we are done with development. So the project management is something super important and we really care about that at Longhorn Games uh, because keeping track of a project is a full-time job. So we have to know the state of the project at all times and we should always take care of the project. We should pay full attention to, the, to the, all of the details and this should be done by a single person and should be done with care. Uh, with care. So the role of the product or project manager is doing a lot of research, checking the state of the game, trying to see the weak points, trying to improve those, and basically communicate with all the team, keep the communication in a good level, and also make sure that the deadlines uh, will be met. This is also super important. So a, a product manager is uh, one of the key elements of uh, a hyper casual team, we believe. Yeah. And next to that, there are some project management tools that we can use during the development of our hyper casual games. There are a lot of tools, uh, namely Asana, Trello, etc. One of these uh, will work, but we should be using some agile methodologies. methodologies. Uh, let's say Kanban or uh, or some other uh, methodology, it doesn't really matter. But we should pick one and we should um, we should not uh, go out of the methodology. We should keep the work uh, always sync uh, in the management tool. Let's say if we are using Trello, we should always have a task for all the work being done and all the developers should open, up, open a new task if they are doing something new, and if they completed the task, they should just check it as done. Um, so in that way, we can uh, immediately see the state of the project, and we can see who is working on what, and how many tasks do we have to be done. And this is also super important. Using a project management tool uh, is uh, really crucial. Yeah, so let's say we are now at the phase of testing and we need to start testing our prototype. Now the CPI uh, plays a key role because without a CPI, developing a game is almost, is almost pointless, right? So because nobody is going to play your hyper casual game and you need to invest some time uh, into, re into researching these similar games, CPI videos and creatives and try to understand why they worked, why they were successful and low CPI videos. And you should try to implement the same ideas into your videos as well. Also, uh, uh, generating a creative is a skill and not everyone can do that. So a, a studio must have the skill and should be able to generate their own creatives. And that way they can always find some lower CPIs. Because sometimes a creative uh, might be worth a million dollars, you never know. Yeah, and if we talk about some tips and tricks about CPI videos, they should have great visuals. They should look pleasing, pleasing to the eye. And we should tap into player psychology, we should Think like we are a player and what would attract us to the video. And the video should be immediately clear in and understandable in three to five seconds. And the colors uh, should be in good contrast and with just simple colors, it shouldn't be really cluttered. And we should be creative because we want our videos to be uh, attractive and intriguing. And last tip is just hire someone for creatives because it's also a whole profession by itself and not everyone is capable of creating some good creatives because 
it also requires some knowledge and experience, and it requires some knowledge from the field. Last but not least, yeah, please don't feel overwhelmed. We all know that hypercasual uh, game genre is uh, really tiresome sometimes because you test a lot of games and then most of them fail and then you immediately go to the next one. It also fails and it can be really um, bugging. But don't focus on the failures, just focus on the improvements. And let's say you are improving your CPR results, your retention. So that means over time, you really have a potential to uh, find the next big hit game. And it, not, it might not be too far away from you. That concludes my speech. And thanks everyone for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, really exciting um and very well structured so meaning we can take it and uh, just use it um one uh, short question uh, to complete uh, this uh, practical approach uh, could you please name um, the main tools or instruments you use uh, to complete um uh, that uh, stages yourself your helpers okay sure so for project management we are using currently ClickUp. It is a tool, something like Trello. Uh, for communication, we are mostly using uh, Discord, but also sometimes Slack. And for our cloud build system, we are currently using Unity cloud build system. Although we are currently working on our own system, we might activate this at that point. This is something I also recommend because sometimes you need some custom needs for your own builds. And we have a lot of uh, automated scripts on our servers. We have some servers on AWS, uh, which automates our package publishing and package updating. We also have a package register server. So we are investing a lot in the DevOps side of the things, and we have our own servers that are automating things so that we can save time continuously on a daily basis. Great. And uh, what do you use for flow charting? For flow charting, we are currently using Lucidchart, if you know about it. It's, it's just a simple tool where you can draw some uh, shapes and arrows, and it just works for us. Great, thank you. We have um, a couple of questions more. Um, uh, first of them is uh, very tough, I believe. How to set a proper deadline? Oh, very good question. Uh, that almost always depends on the project and the team. So there are a lot of parameters and you need to take all these parameters into consideration. First of all, the, uh, um, the capacity of the projects, because sometimes the capacity, the capacity of the project is too large. Uh, the uh, project is too extensive to be completed in a few weeks, then almost a month is fine, right? Because there's nothing you can do about it. But if it's a simple runner project and you need to uh, actually make the simple project faster by creating some tools. For example, we have a runner template project, so we can uh, create a runner in a few days. For these kind of projects, it should be super fast. And if, if, if it is not fast, then you should try to think what you can improve. So what I mean is, in the end, uh, you always need to take all these parameters into consideration, but you also need to think how can I make this faster? This is the key a point of view, in my opinion. Great, thank you so much. Uh, very quick question. You've already mentioned uh, this, but still, uh, what tools would you recommend for uh, build automation? How uh, you are doing it in your studio? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are using Unity Cloud Build. It's kind of slow for us. Uh, because the concurrent builds sometimes wait a lot. Let's say they wait for 10 minutes before the next one starts. I don't really like that. I want my builds to complete as fast as possible. So for, for that reason, uh, I started building our own build system using some uh, batch scripting and some AWS servers. Uh, but yeah, for the time being, we are stuck with the Unity Cloud build system. Great. Thank you so much, Azan. Guys, if you have uh, more uh, questions about this uh, priceless uh, practical approach 
uh, try to catch us on uh, in the chat uh, or in a point um, and um, uh, on LinkedIn, I believe you can uh, also meet um, ask, ask all your questions. Uh, I believe uh, Azan could not uh, squeeze all his knowledge and all his uh, tips uh, into that short 30 minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Azan. Uh, Thanks so much, Alexander. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.